Hush, little baby, don't say a word Mama's gonna buy you a mockingbird And if that mockingbird won't sing Mama's gonna buy you a diamond ring Greetings, my lovelies. This is Miss Murder with another tale of terror for you. First of all, Rage Against the Night is a compilation of horror stories about people who have conquered, or at the very least, come to terms with something dark in their lives. It is from Gary A. Brownbeck, and it's called Afterward, There Will Be a Hallway. From the Musée des Beaux Arts, W. H. Auden, about suffering they were never wrong, the old masters, how well they understood its human position, how it takes place, while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. In italics, fingers barely brushing the surface of her skin, but still her eyes fall through their sockets and into the back of her skull with soft, dry sounds touching her cheeks, wanting to hold her face as a lover should, whispering that everything will be all right. It will. You'll see. She only has to come back. Please, please come back. Don't leave again. Dear God, please. But her head collapses inward, flesh crumbling apart, flaking away, fragmenting, becoming slivers, becoming specks, becoming dust, her face sinking, splitting into half, disintegrating, staring helpless as the rest of her crumples and decays, revealing nothing within the parched shards of what was once her lips holding their form only one more second, long enough to say that it's time to get out of sleepy head. Come on, it's Wednesday. It's going to start in a couple of hours. You've only reminded me ten times since last night, I mumbled, head still buried underneath the sheet, a preview of that day when the sheet would not be pulled back and I'd be lying in a cold drawer in a cold room in the cold basement of some hospital like the rest of them. Some day, just not today. As with most mornings, I was ambivalent about how I felt on the subject of that particular eventuality. I had not been dreaming. <laughs> I rarely dream these days. No, I've been lying there envisioning what might happen if I were to chance to touch it. Don't. Just, just don't. You know better than to do this to yourself, Neil, my man. I sat up, rubbed my eyes, and focused on the little girl standing in the doorway to my bedroom. Seven, no. No, wait, just turned eight years old. She still wore the Scooby-Doo pajamas underneath the white hospital robe and those SpongeBob SquarePants slippers that looked cute from a distance but were, in fact, unbelievably creepy when you saw them up close. Her complexion was a sickly shade of yellow-white with dark brownish-purple arcs under her eyes. Her left hand rose up to scratch at the padded, custom-made bandana covering her bald head. The chemotherapy must have been hellish. Every time I looked at her, I wondered if I could have held on as long as she did. She stared at me for a moment and asked, Can we open it now? You've only been here two days. You know my rule. Hands on hips, one foot impatiently tapping, lower lip sticking out in defiance. But it's a dumb rule. One whole week? How come I gotta wait a whole week? Because I... I rubbed my face, feeling the first twinges of pain behind my left eye. A sure sign that a migraine was going to visit me today if I wasn't careful. Would you please come over here, Melissa? Not until you start calling me Missy. I asked you, like, what, a hundred times? Oh, don't be so dramatic. It's only like the second or third time, and you know it. Still, you better not think it's dumb. Mom calls me Missy because it sounds like messy, and she was always saying how my room was such a disaster area. Messy, Missy. I liked it. So you call me that, okay? I actually managed a small grin. Your wish is my command, Messy, Missy. I pointed to the foot of the bed. Now, would you come over here and sit down, please? She hesitated for only a moment before doing as I asked. I imagine her mother had warned her about strangers, about never, ever talking to them, let alone sitting on their beds. I turned on the nightstand light, blinking against a sudden bright burst. Missy, have, have you ever gotten mad at one of your friends and said something that you felt bad about later? Well, duh, who hasn't? My one-week rule is sort of my way of, of making sure something like that doesn't happen with you and your stuff, duh. 
She cocked her head to the side and squinted at me. You know that doesn't make any sense, right? God, you're weird. I sighed. Okay, look at it this way. It's like, and I'm not weird. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. I are too. I am not. Shut up. You are too. I've seen weird people before, and you are a freakazoid, mister. You don't have any friends except for that lady who's asleep in the other room, and she's never awake, so for all I know, she hates your guts. Nobody ever calls. You don't go anywhere except to drive around all day stealing boxes. You almost never smile, and when you do, you look like you're trying to poop but can't. You're weird. Yep. Lost that one. Something in my face must have alarmed her, because after a few moments, she leaned forward and said, I'm sorry. Really? I didn't mean it in, in a bad way, you know? You're weird, but it's a, it's a good weird, I think. You don't have to apologize, Missy. You're right. I am weird, and I don't have any friends. Not even that sleeping lady? I knew she'd get around to exploring the guest room sooner or later. I'd been hoping for later. I don't know. I, I don't know how she feels about me. Who is she anyway? Her name's Rebecca. She was my wife. How long has she been dead? Three years this Friday. She doesn't look very good. Her breathing's all wheezy and her skin... Could we get back on the subject, please? I was more than aware of how Rebecca looked and sounded, unless things had worsened since I checked on her last night. Though I know I should, and maybe even part of me wanted to, I couldn't go back in there. Not this morning. Seeing her last night, her hair still falling out in clumps, cheeks more hollow than the day before, lips cracked and parched. The black blotches on her skin seemed to expand as I stood there watching. It was bad enough. A second visit this soon was more than I could take. Missy looked out toward the hallway deep in an eight-year-old's thoughts and then turned back to me and said, I could be your friend. That's sweet, but you're not going to be around that long. Because of this one-week rule thing? Yeah, I know this seems unfair, but I'm only doing it for your own good. Oh, dear God, did I actually just say that? It's like when you do something or say something that seems like what you want to do or say right then at that second, understand? So you say it or do it, and then later on you wish you hadn't because it was mean or inconsiderate or just plain dumb. You wish you could take it back, but you can't. Does that make sense? A shrug. I guess... Well, it's the same thing with your stuff, only it's a lot more important. Once we open that box, you have to choose something, and it's got to be the right something. If you pick the wrong thing, you'll be... Oh, God. I let fly with a soft groan of frustration. This was more difficult than I thought it would be. Throwing off the covers, I'd slept in my shirt and pants, I stumbled to my feet and crossed to the other side of the bedroom, pulling back the curtain covering the window there. Come here, I want to show you something. Her eyes narrowed. It isn't going to be gross, is it? One time, this boy in my class, Eric, he said he had something real cool to show me, and it turned out he had this fat, old, slimy, nasty water bug that he'd squished open with his fingers. It looked like it had a big glob of snot with legs and pinchers. I couldn't eat my pudding for lunch that day, and I like pudding a lot. No squished bugs or anything like that, I promise. She came over to the window and looked down at the street. I live on the 12th floor of one of Cedar Hill's nicer apartment buildings, and the windows in my bedroom and living room all offer a good view of the downtown area. I pointed. See that old brick building down the street with those stone steps? Gargoyle Castle, she said, giggling. What? Gargoyle Castle, you freakazoid. It's got those stone gargoyles up near the top. See? So I always called it Gargoyle... I Follow the line of reasoning, thanks so much, and stop calling me freakazoid. It's rude and it gets old in a hurry. She smiles. Says you. The truth was, I'd forgotten about the gargoyles that squat over the stone archway of what used to be the building and loan fort. So for a moment, I was seeing it through her eyes, and it was, as she might put it, way cool. But the feeling passed. It always did. Okay, I said, look down at the steps of the gargoyle castle and tell me what you see. She leaned closer to the window, concentrating for all she was worth, and then said, That guy sitting there with that tin cup, is he what you wanted me to see? Yes, his name was Leonard, but he liked being called Lenny. Lenny fought in Vietnam, did two tours of duty. That cup, which is steel, by the way, not tin, belonged to him. It was part of the sea rations kit. You know what sea rations are? Yeah, I saw this movie one time with my mom on TV about these soldiers in World War II. Lee Marvin was in it. Mom always watched Lee Marvin movies. She said he was a hottie. She, I always thought he looked like someone who was mean but wished he wasn't. 
Anyway, they had those sea ration kits in the movie, and that's what they ate from. She seemed so very proud that she was able to answer my question, so I made sure to look suitably impressed. I nodded toward Lenny. He carried that cup inside the pocket of his vest. You can't see it from here, but there's a pretty big dent in the side. That's because it deflected a bullet that would have blown his hip to pieces and probably crippled him. He never went anywhere without that cup afterward. He called it his bad luck shield. His what? His good luck charm. Oh, she looked down at Lenny once again. So when you guys opened Lenny's box, he chose this cup. His good luck charm, right? Not exactly. Uh, the cup was the first thing Lenny saw, and he was, he was just really happy to see it again, so he just grabbed it without thinking. She gave a soft but genuine gasp. It wasn't the thing he was supposed to pick? No. And because he grabbed the wrong thing without thinking, he's stuck here. He hangs out on those steps, always, and he always will. Maybe not those same steps, but he'll be waiting around somewhere. Because he can't take it back. I nodded. Because he can't take it back. That's so sad. Does he have anyone to talk to? I talk to him almost every day. Sometimes other people like him come by. Really? You'd be surprised how many people like you and Lenny wander the streets around here, Missy. And you see all of them? Oh, no. <laughs> Not even close. When Lenny's got a visitor who's... I mean, I can only see and talk with those whose belongings... Wait a second, look. Sure enough, Lenny, ever the social butterfly, was chatting away. Hey, said Missy, who's that pretty lady he's talking to? Oh, wow, isn't her hair beautiful? She looks like she's going to the Oscars or something fancy like that. She looked at me. Don't you think she's pretty? I have no idea. I can't see her. But she's right there. I don't doubt it, Missy. Honestly, I don't. But the thing is, whoever she is, I wasn't the one who took care of her personal effects. Her what? Her things. I wasn't the one who picked her box of stuff. Okay, so how come I can see her? Because the dead can all see each other. Huh. She stared for a moment longer, and then her face brightened. So it's kind of like a secret club. Oh, that is so cool. Hey, can we go around today and see how many I can spot, but you can't? It'll be like a game you can play in a long car trip. Bury the cow or I spy. We can do whatever you want, Missy. Speaking of, I dropped the curtains back into place. Are you sure you want to go to your own funeral? Yep. I want to see Mom again, and I want to see if me and old Eric feels bad now about what he did to me with a water bug. That was so disgusting! She gave an overly theatrical shudder. When that got no reaction from me, she repeated it, only this time throwing one arm up, the back of her hand pressed against her forehead. Oh, sir, she said in a not bad imitation of a southern bell, I do believe I am about to faint. Ham is right, I said, trying to stop my, according to her, constipated smile. That's some fierce overacting, my dear. She flung herself against my dresser, one hand still plastered for her forehead, the other now pushing forward to fend off the evil Yankee. You must leave me to my honor, sir. You must show some decency. I applauded, and she took a broad, grandiose bow. I was going to be an actress on the soaps. You're certainly pretty enough. I bet you would have been great. Me too. No sadness, no regret, just a simple statement of fact. Most of the people I deal with usually crack at that moment of epiphany like, Me too. This, their bitterness, their anger, fear, grief, reducing them for a time to a crumpled handful of spoiled human material whose potential they now knew would never be realized. I'd been listening to it for nearly three years now. This culminative symphony of human misery, hurt, loneliness, terror, rage, despair, all of it in search of an outlet, something to give it purpose, an endless sonata of sorrow and hopelessness composed by those whose existence has ground to a halt in a series of sputtering little agonies, leaving them with nowhere to go, nothing to hold on to, and no one to speak with except some stranger whose job it is to gather the detrius left behind by the odd ones, the damaged, the devastated ones, the ruined ones, the old, the alone, and the forgotten. Yeah, I'm a real party monster, a real chuckle fest. Just ask my wife. Maybe she'll answer you if there's anything left of her. Melissa was the youngest I dealt with, and she still had all the pent-up, eager, impatient energy of a child. It was probably that very impatience that caused her to show up so soon after her death. 
When I had retrieved the discarded box of her personal effects from beside the hospice dumpster, her body still lay inside her room, waiting to be picked up by the funeral home. I put the box in the trunk of my car, drove home, and found her sitting in the middle of my living room when I walked in through the door. Hey, she said softly to me now, as she did then. Something in her voice warned me she was about to ask a question I didn't want to answer. We need to start getting ready. Well, I need to, anyway. I started toward the bathroom and was mere inches from a clean getaway when Missy asked, How did Rebecca die? And there it was. But I was ready, snapping my fingers as if I just remembered something. I made a sharp right turn in the hallway and called back, I almost forgot I have a surprise for you. A surprise? She was in the living room before I was, her sudden presence startling the hell out of me. Ah, oh, damn, Missy! I asked you to please not do that anymore. Three years and it still unnerves me the way they can pop in and out of a room whenever they want. I'm sorry, she said. I just got all excited when you said, it's all right now. Close your eyes. Find me the kid that can resist those three words. Missy did as I asked, bouncing up and down on the balls of her feet. If I listened hard enough, I bet I could have heard her ethereal molecules going, Oh, goody, 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 goody. I pulled the wrap package from its hiding place behind the television and held it out to her. This was as much an experiment as it was an evasive tactic. Okay, open them. She did, her eyes growing almost absurdly wide as she jumped up and down, practically squealing. Oh, goody, a present! And she took it from my hands. So I was right. If it's an action they performed without thinking when alive, they can continue to do so after death. I'd expect her to make a quick, ferocious work of the wrapping paper as would any child thrilled over a present, but instead she looked it over, studying it. This is real nice paper. You did a great job wrapping it. The ribbon's beautiful. She studied it a little more, a jeweler determining the carat value of a diamond, then held it up by her ear and gave it a little shake. Hmm, I wonder what it is. By now I was ready to tear the paper off the damn thing, but then just as quickly realized she'd not only reaffirmed one of my theories, but also just shown me what an extraordinary little girl she was, had been. She knew, at age eight, she knew that a surprise equaled a mystery, and any good mystery was to be savored as much as solved. I froze at the sight of her smile. I had never seen such a radiant smile before. Or, if I had, was too full of myself to... You don't have any friends except for that lady who's asleep in the other room, and she's never awake, so for all I know, she hates your guts. Notice it. It was the kind of smile that told you she'd just been let in on this big secret, something so wonderful and great and full of happy promises that nothing would ever seem bad or sorrowful to her again. And standing there in my living room, nailed to the spot, at the sight of her smile, her joy, her ability to savor the wonder and anticipation, my defenses, taken by surprise, dumbstruck by the sudden rush of emotions, I fell a little bit in love with her. Don't misunderstand, there's nothing even remotely sexual about it, nothing physical or lustful or perverted. I fell in love with her the same way some people fall in love with a piece of music, or a certain time of day, or a season of the year, twilight and autumn, or even an idea. It was the kind of startling, forceful promise of salvation love a person experiences maybe two or three times in their life should they be graced with the long one. My breath cut in my throat and my arms would not move. I refused to blink. Everything I'd once believed to be good and pure and redeeming of life stood less than two feet away from me in the form of an eight-year-old girl who would never know her first kiss, her first dance, or the first time she held a boy's hand. For her, there would be no late night study sessions cramming for the big exam, no prom, no graduation parties, no first job, first paycheck, first promotion, none of that for messy missy. For her, there was only this moment, this breath in this place, with this wonderful mystery wrapped in shabby looking paper I'd grab from a discount bin at the last minute before getting in the checkout line. Are you okay? She said, taking a step toward me. I blinked, wiped up my eyes, exhaled, and took a step back. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I, I guess my mind just wandered off for a moment. I flashed my best constipated smile. Well, go ahead, open it. Okay. Even then, she didn't rip the paper to shred. She carefully unwrapped it. A corner here, a corner there, until the paper was loose enough for her to reach in and pull out the gift, which she did with her eyes closed. Oh, this is going to be good, isn't it? 
For the love of God, open your eyes and find out. Jeez, don't bust a vein. She opened her eyes, saw what it was, and then squealed loudly, jumping up and down while simultaneously twirling. The SpongeBob SquarePants movie! You said you never got to see it, right? No, but I'm going to watch it while you take your shower. She stepped her twirling and held the DVD against her chest as if she expected some stinking pirate to come sailing out of nowhere and be a relieving her of her treasure before making her walk the plank. Yar. Oh, no, wait, wait, hang on. You know what would be great? Oh, this would be way cool. Listen, we can make popcorn tonight and watch it then. Mom and me, we had the special recipe for buttered popcorn. I could make it for us. You'll love my popcorn. You will, you will. I swear you will. I pointed at the television, but I thought... You wanted to watch it now. Well, duh, I do, but SpongeBob, he's more fun to watch with someone else than just all by yourself. We could, oh, hey, hang on. We could maybe see if Rebecca feels like watching it with us. We could even invite Lenny and his new girlfriend. She gasped, her eyes growing even wider. We could have a party. Oh, rock out. Let's do that, okay? Let's have a party tonight. SpongeBob Missy's funeral party. You want to have a party to watch SpongeBob and celebrate your funeral? She turned into a human bobblehead figure on way too much sugar. It'll be so awesome. And you call me weird. Oh, this is like one of the most awesomest presents ever. You rock! Thank you so much! And before I could move, she ran forward and gave me a great big hug. And the next thing I knew, I was crying out. But there was no sound, no matter how hard she tried. And she wondered what had happened to her voice. And why wasn't anyone here? She had to go to the bathroom. And oh, God, it hurt. It hurt. It hurt, it hurt, it hurt, it hurt so much. And she tried to roll over and press the button. So the nurses would come, but she couldn't move her legs. And there was a sudden liquid fire spreading down the backs of her legs. And she started crying because she soiled her bed again. And, oh, God, it burned so much when her bowels let go. And she closed her eyes and tried to think of something funny. Something cool like winter snow and goofy snowmen. But there were arms, strong arms, helping her up. But she vomited all over herself and the nurse. And, Mommy, where are you? I hurt. Mommy, I hurt. And now it was me that hurt. I felt all of it, the sickness and the pain and the vomiting and the pissing and the shitting and she gets so cold and couldn't stop shaking and it felt like her teeth were going to smash to get some of the reins every time they chattered together but then the shot came and she felt warm so warm again with fresh sheets and a new gown and her sponge pot slippers keeping her feet snug and she began to fade away a little while then awoke to see mommy sitting on beside her bed holding her hand telling her she was being such a brave, strong little girl that she'd feel better soon. She did she want another shot? They could give her another shot now if she wanted. And Missy said, yes, please. And could I have some pudding, too? I like pudding a lot. I promise not to spill any. <sighs> on my hands and knees on the floor, my body still wrecked with the physical agony of her last few hours, but it would fade. I knew it would. This is why I always made it a point to never touch any of them or let any of them touch me. There were always remnants, some strong, some weaker, but none of them coming close to what had just chewed through me. Oh my god, shouted Missy, dropping to her hands and knees beside me. Oh my god, I'm so, I'm so sorry I am. Please don't be mad. Is there anything I can do? Do you need me to get you? She reached out. Don't, don't touch me, please. It'll happen again. I turned my head toward her and I tried to smile, but it hurt too much. It's, it is not that I didn't enjoy the hug, okay, sweetie. It was really sweet, but you, you, you can't. I can't. I couldn't finish and I lay stomach down on the floor. Missy leaned down and whispered, is it okay if I stay with you? Sure, hun, whatever you want. Uh, then I'll be right here. Okay. Hey, hey, Neil? It was the first time she'd called me by my name. What is it? Uh, I'm sorry, Rebecca killed herself. The other reason I try to avoid touching or being touched, they always pick up on some remnant within me. So am I. Christ, why wasn't the pain fading yet? D do you know why she did it? I shook my head, which, considering the threat of the migraine on top of the rest of it, was perhaps not the best course of action. Don't know, Missy. I really don't, I said, lying. Shh, there, there. You rest, okay? I'll be right here when you wake up. D -d -d don't know why she did. There's, there's so much I don't know. The pain became a wave of cold nausea, and I passed out beneath its force. Here is what I do know. They come to me as they were at the moment of their deaths. That is the only thing on which there has never been any variation. They retain their five senses if they had them all while still alive. Until Missy, the usual period between death and turning up in my life was between 10 days and one month. It was exactly 23 days after her suicide that Rebecca showed up in the guest room where I'd found her body. But there are at least a dozen who have yet to show up even after three years. Most of them don't like to talk too much in the first few days, Missy and Lenny being the exceptions there. And again, excluding Missy and Rebecca, all of them died alone and forgotten. Some in the hospital, some in the nursing home, some in the hospice. No one coming forward to claim either their bodies or the boxes containing their personal effects. 
Here is what I have learned. Death is not instantaneous. The cells go down one by one and it takes a while before everything's finished. If a person wanted to, they could snatch a bunch of cells hours after somebody's checked out and grow them in cultures. Death is a fundamental function. Its mechanisms operate with the same attention to detail, the same conditions for the advantage of organisms, and the same genetic information for guidance through the stages that most people equate with the physical act of living. So I ask myself, if it's such an intricate, integrated physiological process, at least in the primary local stages, then how do you explain the permanent vanishing of consciousness? What happens to it? Does it just screech to a halt, become lost in humus? What? Nature doesn't work like that. It tends to find perpetual uses for its more elaborate systems. And that gave me an idea. Maybe human consciousness is somehow severed at the filaments of its attachments and then absorbed back into the membrane of its origin. I think that's all they are by the time they come to me. The severed consciousness of a single cell that hasn't died but is, instead, vanishing totally into its own progeny. I don't have the slightest goddamn idea what you're talking about, Lenny said to me on this third night in my company. We were sitting at my kitchen table, putting a pretty good dent in a bottle of Glenlivet I bought earlier that day, knowing it was Lenny's poison of choice. Not, not all of your cells have died yet, I said, only slightly slurring my words, and the ones that are still alive remember you. And as long as one cell remembers, you're tied to the corporeal, to the physical body in some form. But when those final cells finally give it up, I snapped my fingers as I had actually made my point. I'm guessing you weren't a big churchgoer, said Lenny Tampy and smoke out of the pack lying on the table and lighting up. I leaned back in my chair, grinning. Okay, smartass, let me ask you something then. How is it you're still able to smoke a cigarette? Lenny looked at the smoke he held between his fingers as if it were something he'd never seen before. You don't remember doing that, do you? He shook his head. That's the answer. Or at least part of it. There's a thousand things we do every day without thinking. Walking, eating, breathing, lighting a cigarette, picking up a pen, taking a piss. All done by rote. We explain it away by saying that we do it unconsciously. But the truth is that it's our cells that remember all this stuff for us that tell the rest of our body how to lift a phone receiver or add a little more sugar to the iced tea because it's not sweet enough. Don't you get it, Lenny? You're here with me because those cells in you that are still alive haven't figured out yet that you're gone. Horse shit. I bought the farm almost a month ago. You're not really going to sit there and try to tell me that buried under the ground in Cedar Hill Cemetery, there's some part of my body that's still alive on a cellular level, are you? I'm here. That's that. And that don't mean nothing. I was on my fourth drink, well past my limit of two and feeling no pain. <laughs> you, you remember Medgar Evers, the civil rights leader from Mississippi? Bet your ass I do, hell of a guy. Took him 30 years, but they finally put that bastard back with the way for assassination. R remember when they exhumed Evers' body before Beckwith's third trial in 94? How there was almost no decomposition after 30 years in the ground? Yeah. I, I saw this cable special one night where um, one of the medical examiners who studied Evers' body was being interviewed, <coughs> and he talked about how on a routine examination of some tissue, he detected the smallest amount of cell activity, an embalmed body 30 years in the ground, and there was still cell activity in the tissue. So don't say horse shit to me, buddy. He crushed out his smoke, poured himself another shot, and lit up a fresh cigarette. It ain't exactly like these can hurt me now, is it? Is that what our way of saying that maybe, maybe I'm right? It's my saying that maybe, maybe you're not full of shit right up to the eyeballs, but that's as far as I go. You know, you remind me of this chopper pilot I once caught a ride from, from Two Core and Plyku. Son of a bitch must love the sound of his own voice, too, because, man, he could go on and on about anything. And most of what he talked about, he didn't know Jack, but that that stop him? Hell no. It was because of Lenny I discovered that they don't sleep. I found out later that night when I heard him cry out from the small room that I laughingly called my office. I was still in the process of cataloging the contents of his personal effects and had left the lid off the box. He wandered in there, saw his sea rations cup, and without thinking, picked it up. 
they can touch and hold those inanimate things that had meaning for them when they were alive, even if these objects weren't among their final personal effects. A favorite book or magazine, a record or CD, a toy or knick-knack, even, believe it or not, kitchen utensils and equipment. I once had a wonderful older lady, Grace, never was someone named more appropriately, who all but danced a jig when she saw that I had an old-fashioned stand-up mounted mixer and insisted on baking cookies and a cake. Once she saw the mixer, everything in the kitchen took on meaning for her, and she puttered around in there for days. It was actually comforting listening to her occupy herself, the clinking of dishes, the rattling of spoons, the sound of the mixer working overtime. It reminded me of when I was a child sitting in the living room at Christmas time, listening to my mother work her magic over holidays. Grace even hummed while she baked an old lullaby that my mother used to sing to me when I was young. You can take the Toy Town trolley and meet the Jolly Time Express. No one there is melancholy, it's an isle of happiness. Don't you keep your dreamboat waiting, hope you have a pleasant stay on Hushabye Island on Rockabye Bay. Yes, it's corny as hell, but I don't care. Hey, Sinatra recorded it, so don't get too high and mighty. It was nice, during Grace's stay, to feel something of my mother close to me again. Lastly, here is what I hope. I hope. Um, well, on second thought, let's skip that last one. I would have been pissing in the wind and praying for rain anyway. A photograph of Melissa taken at her seventh birthday party had been enlarged and set on an easel near the head of the closed casket. Even from the back of the crowded room, you could see her sweet, grinning face and know how much has been lost. There must have been at least 75 people there, possibly more. I was dressed in my best suit and trying to look like I was wearing it instead of the other way around as I walked up to the polished wood podium holding the guest book and signed Lenny's name. That's not very nice, Missy whispered to me. You really ought to sign your own name. Looking up to make sure no one was watching, I whispered as softly as I could. We talked about this, Missy. <sighs> A sigh. I know. I can't talk to you once we're inside, Missy. People might think I'm crazy. This sucks. She looks toward the clothes casket. How come the lid's shut like that? And, oh, God, I can't believe she used that picture. I look like a pug. She stared for a moment, touching her hospital robe, and her trembling hand moved slowly toward her bandana. Do, do I look that awful? Tears coming into her voice before they appeared in her eyes. I didn't think I looked that ugly. Not so ugly that Mommy wouldn't, wouldn't want people to see me. I reached out to take hold of her hand, but pulled back almost at once. I couldn't chance another episode this soon. It had taken the better part of 20 minutes for the pain to subside as I lay on the floor of my living room, and true to her word, Missy never moved away from me the entire time. When I was at last able to speak in almost complete sentences, I asked her to go into the bathroom, get into the medicine cabinet above the sink, and bring me one of the boxes containing the pre-measured shot of Imitrax I took when the migraine hit. And make no mistake, once Missy's pain had faded away, the full-blown migraine was there in all its shimmering, aura-soaked, drilling, nausea-inducing glory. I listened as Missy ran into the bathroom, threw open the cabinet door, and knocked over most of the contents within as she grabbed the Imitrax. I could hear her tearing open the box as she came back to the living room. You sure you can hold this thing? she asked. You seem real shaky. Here, I'll do it. P please don't... Shut up, dummy. I'm not going to touch you. How do you... This doesn't look like any needle I've seen. How am I supposed to... I explained, not once having to repeat myself, and she administered the shot like a pro. It took about 30 seconds before it began its voodoo, and then I realized there was something I'd forgotten to tell her. I am so ahead of you, she said, setting the emptied waste paper basket by my side as I struggled into a sitting position. You... <laughs> You, you, you might ought to look away for this next part, I said. She shrugged. Don't bother me to see somebody else puke. I would have said something witty and Noel coward-like in response, but by then my head was buried deep in the plastic basket and things were taking their natural course. If I don't take the shot in time, then migraines in full tilt boogie mode by the time the medicine enters my system, I vomit. Unconditionally. Like this time, I wouldn't have been surprised if I'd seen my shoes land in there. Afterwards, shoving the basket away, I fell back on the floor and lay there shuddering. 
You're all sweaty, said Missy, picking up the basket and marching back in the bathroom. I heard her empty its contents into the toilet and flush it away. After that, she rinsed it out in the bathtub and then did something else at the sink. A few seconds later, she was kneeling beside me again and placing a warm, damp washcloth against my forehead. I began to protest, but she cut me off. I'm not touching you, she said, applying the slightest pressure. There's a wet rag in between us. True enough. She kept her hand there, maintaining pressure until the warmth began to sink into my flesh. She'd gotten the temperature exactly right, and I liked the feeling of her hand against my forehead. You're taking good care of me, I said, managing to produce a second complete sentence in less than three minutes. Things were looking up. Well, a lot of people took real good care of me, and I always paid real good attention, so I learned how to do it, too. Hey, maybe I could have been a nurse, huh? Florence Nightingale's got nothing on you. I bet you don't think I get that, do you? Well, I do know. I know all about Florence Nightingale from school, so there. I laughed, and it hurt. She laughed as well. Better yet? She asked. Yes, yes it is. If you want to tell me where your suit is, I can go lay it out for you. I used to lay out Mommy's work clothes for her at night so they'd be all ready when she got up in the morning. I opened my eyes, relieved to see that the shimmering aura surrounding her and everything else was nearly gone. There's a tan garment bag hanging on the left side of the closet in my bedroom. You shoes in there too? Yep. You pick out a tie yet? If you haven't, can I pick it out for you? That would be very nice of you. She stared at me a few moments longer. You know, if I didn't think it'd give you another bad fit, I'd kiss your cheek. You look like you could use a kiss on the cheek. I appreciate the thought, though. Yeah. Well, then she did something marvelous. She removed her hand from the washcloth, bent down, and pressed her lips against it, kissing my forehead through the still, damp cotton. That worked okay, I guess. I liked it. She shook her index finger at me. Mommy warned me that that's what all dirty old men say just before they start perving on you, so you watch it, buddy. I'm not that old. No, but you do need a shower. Phew, you do. You stink. Go deal with it. Then she was off to lay out my suit and shoes, choose my tie, a silk number and a soft muted shade of red, my socks, black, and wait for me to pull myself together and shower. Now, standing in the main viewing room at Chris Brothers' funeral home, she was crying and feeling embarrassed and humiliated because she thought she looked so ugly at the end, which meant she thought she looked ugly now, and I just chickened out on maybe taking hold of her hand and maybe, maybe helping her to feel a little bit better. I knelt down, acting as if I were retying one of my shoes. Stop it, Missy! My teeth were clenched together and I was trying not to move my lips so I'd emerge sounding like, Stop it, Missy! I didn't want to be ugly. Oh, look at Mommy. She's so sad. And the crying, which before had been only sniffles and a few cracked words accompanied stray tears, now threatened to erupt into body-racking sobs. She was so scared and ashamed and confused, and me, I just knelt there, scolding her, useless, awkward, self-conscious, ineffectual, and inept, having just denied her the one gesture that might have told her she was still beautiful, that no one was ashamed of her, she wasn't repulsive, and never had been... I'm sorry that Rebecca killed herself. No, I thought. It will not be this way, not within reach of my arm. Maybe if I'd been able to summon this kind of backbone sooner, Rebecca wouldn't have... wouldn't have. I reached out and took hold of Missy's hand, prepared for the onslaught of sensations and memories I was sure were about to kick my ass in the next week. That is when I discovered what happens if I mentally prepare myself for the consequences of touching them before doing so. I felt only the hand of a frightened little girl. Missy looked at me, tears streaming down her cheeks, and tried to say something, but all that emerged was a pained splutter of nonsensical sounds as she gave my hand a squeeze, let go, and threw her arms around my neck. Uh, I'm not ugly, am I, Neil? No, honey, of course you're not. Shh. Right there. Come on, Missy. An old woman seated in a chair near the back row heard me and turned around to stare. Seeing that I was talking to myself, her eyes narrowed in disgust. I'm sorry, I said to her. I just, I knew Missy and it was a terrible thing. The emotion in my voice wasn't much of an affectation as I thought it would be. The old woman's eyes softened and the slightest ghost of a smile crossed her face. She gave me a slight nod. Maybe the poor fellow's really broken up and turned away, leaving the stranger to his grief. Missy pulled in a thick, snot-filled breath and then laughed. 
Boy, that was a close one. Don't say anything, Freakazoid, or somebody will call the nut house to come get you. She gave me a quick kiss on the cheek and broke the embrace, wiping her eyes and nose on the sleeve of her gown. I'm going to go over and see Mommy, okay? I gave a quick nod as I rode with my feet again. Missy didn't cross the room. She simply did her imitation of an electron, bounding from point to point without traversing the space between. Her mother sat in a chair off of the side of the casket and photo display. Missy was now by her side looking uncertain what to do. As soon as Missy appeared, the area she occupied, as if by silent understanding, became at once forbidden to anyone around her. Maybe people were just trying to give Missy's mother a little space. God knew the woman looked exhausted from trying to put on a strong face as she listened to mourners tell her how sorry they were for her loss. But my guess was that Missy was unconsciously emitting some sort of energy that made others nearby sense a sudden otherness in the room, and it might be best to just keep their distance for a few minutes. I moved along the wall, trying to be as invisible as a living person could be, never taking my gaze off Missy and her mother. I caught a millisecond glimpse of the old woman who'd been staring at me. She was leaning over and whispering something to a well-dressed man who had just enough detached concern about him to be easily labeled an employee of the funeral home. I knew without actually looking that both the old woman and the man were talking about me. Do you know him, ma'am? Never saw him before today. I'm not sure, but I think he maybe ought to be watched. I think he's really broken up, poor fellow. He was talking to himself. Not trying to start trouble, you understand. I do, ma'am. I'll keep an eye on him. Great. Last thing I needed was to have any attention drawn to me. Missy was reaching out to take hold of her mother's hand. The funeral home employee was moving away from the old woman and making a beeline in my direction. I couldn't get mad at the guy. He was just doing his job. I didn't have many choices, and what few I did have were depleting fast. Moving away from the wall, I made my way through the clusters of people toward the casket. A prayer bench had been placed close to its side, and I knelt down, making the sign of the cross as I did so, and then folding my hands, lowering my head. Even if the funeral home employee did think I was trouble, he wouldn't dare interrupt me while I was praying. Not that I was praying, but I knew damn well how this looked, and right now the appearance of prayer was good enough to buy me at least two minutes of safety. I did not close my eyes. Instead, I began turning my head small, slow degrees so I could see Missy and her mother, at least peripherally. The first all I managed to do was get the great-grandmother of all neck cramps. But as soon as I saw what was happening, the muscle strain seemed trivial. Missy was squeezing her mother's hand. The woman's head snapped up, her eyes widening as she gasped. Several people turned in her direction, but no one approached. Neil, said Missy, not bothering to whisper because she knew I was the only one who could hear Please come over here. Please come right now. I crossed myself, rose and with a left, right, left, sidestepped the funeral home employee who'd been lurking in wait nearby. I approached Missy's mother, who looked directly at me, smiled and said, Lenny, oh, I'm so glad you could make it. Missy gave me a quick glance, indicating that I needed to take hold of her mother's other hand, which I did at once. Her skin was simultaneously sweaty, yet cracked and calloused. Lenny, said her mother, gesturing with her head for me to lean down. Instead, I got down on one knee. She moved her lips close, but not too close to my ear. I know how most people would take this, but I think you'll understand. I feel I feel her near me right this second. It's so wonderful. She's fine. She feels fine. She isn't suffering anymore. I smiled and looked into her eyes, where before they had been red-rimmed and glossed with that heart-numbed luster from having shed too many tears. Now their shine was one of utter bliss of an inner peace that transcended anything I had ever experienced, and if I'd fallen in love with Missy's joy and innocence before, I felt an equal rush of emotion toward her mother. I had no idea what Missy was doing or even how she was doing it, but it was obvious that this grief-stricken woman would end the day not with the same broken heart and spirit that had been her only interior companion since the death of her daughter, but with a sense of tranquility, even serenity, that would get her through this. Even now, I cannot tell you what Missy's mother, Cynthia, and I talked about. I had become, for lack of a more subtle simile, Melissa's ventriloquist dummy. She was filtering her feelings and memories and thoughts through her mother and into me, compelling me to put those feelings and memories in my own words, more or less, so that for the dozens of people who slowly and cautiously gathered to listen, it sounded as if Cynthia and I were old friends, sharing private moments and recollections about Missy. If there had been any doubt in anyone's mind that I wasn't a friend of the family, those doubts were erased over the next 20 minutes. When at last Cynthia noticed that we gathered an audience, she smiled, wiped her eyes, stood, and said, Everyone, I'm sorry. 
This is Leonard Kessler. He was Melissa's Missy's kindergarten teacher. Everyone, including the old woman who'd been watching me and the funeral home employee, said hello and shook my hand and told me how wonderful it was that I'd come. I discovered, much to my surprise, that Missy had given me a cache of specific memories to share with each person, detailed memories exclusive to the individuals with whom I spoke. Finally, someone, possibly the minister, announced that the service would be starting in five minutes and everyone should take their seats. I gave Cynthia a hug, she kissed my cheek, and I wandered, Reed half staggered, toward the back row where Missy stood waiting. Looking at her now, I realized that I knew her better than I'd known my own wife. Hell, I knew her better than I knew myself. She might have filtered her feelings and memories through her mother in order not to chance another physical incident like the one earlier that morning, but it in no way lessened the way the information and sensations both affected and affected me. Don't you say a word, she said to me. I've decided I don't want to stay for the service. I... Oh, wait, hang on. She made her way over to a well-dressed woman who just entered, holding the hand of a slightly plump boy who was roughly Missy's age. The little boy was practically sobbing. Missy walked up beside him, took hold of his free hand, and whispered something in his ear, then kissed his cheek. The kid looked as if he'd just shaken Spider-Man's hand. His face beamed, and the tears just, voila, stopped. He looked to his right where Missy stood and smiled. Missy smiled back and returned to me. That's Eric, the guy who did the gross bug thing, she said. I told him I wasn't mad so he didn't have to feel, you know, all guilty and stuff. Then I told him he looked real handsome and gave him a kiss. She looked up at me. Some kids say he's fat, but you know what I think? I think he's going to be a real strong football player someday with lots of fans and millions of dollars. And nobody will make fun of him anymore. She studied him for a moment. I bet he grows up to look like a cross between Johnny Depp and George Clooney. He'll be yummy. I almost laughed, but she shot me a look that said, Don't you dare, not in here, freakazoid, and said, I learned that word from Mommy. She thought Lee Marvin was yummy, so don't look at me like that. I'm going to touch you now, so get ready. She grabbed my hand and dragged me toward the door. I figured it out, she said as we made our way out in the parking lot. If one of us sort of prepares, you know, if we make ourselves ready for touching the other person, then we don't got to worry about sending in to fits like before. Fits, I said. Well, that's what it was, wasn't it? All that shaking around, kicking your legs, and gagging on the floor, and puking in a wastebasket? A shrug looked like a fit to me. Missy, why don't you want to stay for your funeral? I told Mommy everything she needs to know to feel better. The rest of it's just going to be a bunch of boring prayers and people crying. It'll be so depressing. She stopped by the car, looked me straight in the eyes, and said, And I changed my mind about one other thing. I want you to call me Melissa from now on, okay? Absolutely. I think it's prettier than Missy anyway. May I ask you why? Her eyes glistened ever so slightly, but she did not cry. I never knew that it was my grandma's middle name. Mommy wanted to name me after Grandma. I never met her. She died before I was born, but I, I gave her crap about it being such an old lady-sounding name. That's when I said, it sounds like an old lady's name. I shouldn't have done that. But your mom, she knows now, right? Melissa nodded her head firmly once. You bet. And she's going to feel better now. I mean, she'll miss me. She then posed like the classic movie star one arm cocked so that the other hand was behind her head, the other hand on her hips, legs crossed at the ankle, Carol Lombard hemming it up for the press before putting her handprints in cement in front of Grauman's Chinese Theater. Come on, look at me. Who wouldn't miss all this? But Mommy will be okay. She put her arms down and looked at me. So what about you? What about me? What's going to make you okay? This isn't about me, Miss um, Melissa. It is if I say so. You said this day was my day that we could do whatever I wanted. Your rules, not mine, smarty pants. And I want to know what I can do to make you feel okay. I got into the car and clipped the Bluetooth cell phone receiver to my ear. It makes me look less weird when I'm talking to no one. Well, no one that anyone can see. Yes, it's a waste of money, but it keeps me from landing in the bin. Melissa was already sitting on the passenger side, arms folded across her chest, glaring at me impatient. I asked you a question, Mr. Gloomy Gus. If I'm going to call you by your name, then you have to call me by mine. It's only fair. Like your stupid one-week rule thing is fair? That kind of fair? I stared at her. She stared at me. I'd like to see you have fun, I replied. Huh? There's a nice little playground not too far from here, Dell Memorial Park, you know it? No. Does it have teeter-totter? 
Yes, and a jungle gym and a slide and a bunch of other stuff. She waved the rest of the way. Not interested in those things. Give me a teeter-totter any day. Serious, dude. I mean, uh, Neil. I started a car. Then to Dell Memorial Park it is. Are you going to meet me there? Nah, she said, settling back into the seat. Think I'll just catch a ride this time. Seatbelt, I said. She stared at me. Dude! I mean, Neil. Think about your, who you're talking to. Seriously. Oh, yeah, sorry. Never mind. Well, duh. <clears throat> there has always been something about playgrounds that strike me as simultaneously joyful, yet also sad and eerie. Despite however many children are running around shrieking and squealing and laughing their heads off, having a high old time as loving parents sit on benches off to the side, watching Jimmy or Susie or Billy or Amy or, insert your child's name here, burn off some of that seemingly everlasting energy that could power a small third world nation or one to harness it properly. Despite the joy and enthusiasm and laughter, I always see playgrounds from a Polympus sort of view. While everyone else looks at the children and the life and the brisk activity, I imagine I can see beneath the surface to where the other playground waits, the deserted one, the one that exists late at night when everyone else has gone home, a silent, shadow-shrouded place that swings with no occupants, moving almost imperceptibly back and forth with the evening breeze, empty teeter-totters that somehow still manage to squeak at the hinges, and metal slides that quietly rattle as something small but hard falls from a nearby tree and rolls down to the ground told you before, I am a walking circus of mirth. But this, what I was watching now, this would have given even the most steely-nerved person a case of the willies. Melissa was running all over the playground, hitting the teeter-totter, the jungle gym, the slide, the swings, all of it, despite her protestations that she didn't care about the rest of the playground's offerings. Laughing her head off, having the grandest of all grand times, playing with at least five other children, none of whom I could see. I wonder how the scene looked to those people who drive by, the teeter-totter going up and down with no one on it, unoccupied swings moving back and forth, some of them snapping up fairly high. They must have thought they were imagining things. Watching Melissa play with unseen children, hearing the chime of her laughter, seeing the happiness on her face and how she looked like such a normal, healthy, vibrant, living child, I don't think I've ever felt so lonely. After a few more minutes, Melissa ran over to me, still giggling over something one of her playmates had just told her, stopped, caught her breath, and said, This isn't working, is it? What do you mean? You still look like a gloomy Gus. The gloomiest Gus. I'm fine. I'm going to hold your hand again, so get ready. I prepared myself, and she did as she threatened. You are so sad, she said. I'm just tired, Melissa, that's all. Uh-uh, buddy, don't lie to me. A tear began forming in one of her eyes. Oh, hey, Melissa, I said, taking hold of her other hand. Don't get upset, okay? I just get like this sometimes. You are like this a lot of the time, I can tell. It passes. You go back and play with your new friends, all right? She shook her head, her eyes unblinking. No, I want to go for another ride, see if I can spot people you can't. Whatever you want. What I... What I want is not to be dead. What I want is for you to, uh, I don't know, smile and mean it. It won't break your face, you know. Well then, why don't we go home? Uh, go to the apartment and watch Spongebob then. I was promised miraculous buttered popcorn, as I recall. Oh, you'll get the popcorn and you'll love it. Okay, let me say goodbye and then we'll go back. You could stay here and play with them a little longer, you know. I mean, it's not like you have to ride back with me. You ask me not to do that popping in and out thing. It makes you nervous. Only if I'm not expecting it. This would be different. Her eyes narrowed. You trying to get rid of me? Not at all, but you're having so much fun and not, not so much fun. Says you, Gloomy Gus. I think I preferred Freakazoid. She parted her hands in front of her. I am fickle and I am dead. So we do things my way. I'm going to go say goodbye to the other kids, and then I want you to take me someplace before we go back to watch Spongebob. Did anyone ever tell you you were kind of bossy? Yes, but I never listened. Like now. And she, with that, she ran off to have one more ride on the teeter-totter with her unseen friends while I sat there trying to think of where she could possibly want me to take her. Ha <laughs> ha! 
You're not serious. Yep, she said. I want to see where you keep the other people's boxes. We were driving around the downtown square where I suspected Melissa would be able to spot others like herself. But if she did, she said nothing. Why would you want to see? I mean, there's nothing. To, I just think it would be interesting. That's all. I made sure to watch the tone of my voice. Look, Melissa, I don't go there unless I have to. Is that another one of your dumb rules? No, it's just the truth. I stopped for a red light near the Sparta and found myself remembering when Rebecca and I first started dating. How we'd always start our Friday nights out at the Sparta for the world's best cheeseburgers. This was back when I was arrogant <laughs> or lazy enough to believe that I knew her. Hey, said Melissa, pointing toward the traffic light. Is there like a certain shade of green you're waiting for? Uh, what? Oh, right. Thanks. <laughs> I pulled away, automatically heading toward the East Main Street Bridge that led into Coffin Country. How come you don't go there unless you have to? My grip tightened on the steering wheel. It's not exactly Disney World in there. It's big, cold, depressing room filled with metal shelves and boxes full of dead people's personal effects. They're stuff. Melissa glared at me for a moment. I remember what personal effects are from what you told me before, so don't explain it every time you say it. I'm not stupid. I didn't mean it to sound that way. I'm sorry. She turned away from me for a few moments, waved at someone I could not see, smiled, and said, Can you see that lady over there by the wall? Without really being aware of it, I'd driven over the bridge and into coffin country. We were once again stopped at a red light right at the corner where the Great Fire of 1968 began when the local casket company went up and took every business in a three-block radius with it. The area never recovered. There was an old but elegant-looking black woman standing in front of a brick wall. If I remembered correctly, this part of Coffin Country, what used to be called Old Town East, used to boast a lot of nightclubs, small museums, and specialty shops. I wondered which type of business that wall belonged to and what memories the old woman associated with it. Yes, I see her. She stood there with her arms spread apart as if waiting for someone to embrace her. Her dress was a thing of tattered, faded elegance, and the gloves she wore looked cheerless. That's the only word I could think of. What's she doing? asked Melissa. I have no idea, hon. There are a lot of um, lost people who live in this area. As if to illustrate my point, a young but horribly disheveled man walked up to the old woman and began asking her in a very loud voice to cut something off his face for him. After a few moments, the old woman smiled, patted his cheek as if he were nothing more than an upset little boy, and gave him a dollar bill from her purse. She then turned back to the wall, her arms spread open for the embrace, while the young man looked at her, looked at the dollar bill, and shuffled quietly away. "'You see him, too?' said Melissa. "'Yeah.' She leaned toward me. I don't know why, but I got a feeling he might be the next person to come stay with you for a while. He's just one of the lost people here, Melissa, that's all. Poor guy's probably crazy or something and can't afford his medications. The light changed and I drove on. Do you always do that? I looked at her. Do what? She looked at the young man who was now stumbling around the corner and then shook her head. Nothing. You're just a lot nicer than you want me to think you are. No, I'm not, but thank you anyway. Hey, I'm bossy, remember? If I say you're nice, then you're nice. But shut up. We fell into a comfortable silence for the next few minutes. Melissa studying the streets and buildings and ruins of buildings with an intensity that you are genetically incapable of after the age of nine, and me simply repeating a route I could drive in my sleep. Cedar Hill Memorial Hospital, both of the city's nursing homes and the county hospice center form an almost perfect circle from my apartment. What makes a circle complete is stopping by the Old Town East Storage before heading back home. While this fact has always been present in my mind, I don't know that it has ever really hit me as hard as it did as Melissa and I drove toward the OTES facility. For three years I've been driving and living in one ongoing circle, a moth around a light bulb deciding whether or not to give in to the temptation. A plane in a holding pattern, waiting for clearance to land. A humorless straight man stuck in a revolving door in some silent two-reeler from the 20s, waiting for some punchline to the gag. I pulled up to the locked gates and dug my key card from my wallet. I was getting ready to swipe it when Melissa said, You'd really do it, wouldn't you? Do what? She nodded at the gates. Take me in there and show me the boxes. You said you wanted to see them. 
and you said that the place depressed you. No, I said that the room was big, cold, and depressing. Same thing. Technically, no, because shut up. You'd really take me in there and show it to me, even if it makes you sad. I said nothing. There seemed to be no point. I'm going to hold your hand for a minute, Melissa said. She did, and for the next few seconds, I was aware of her being somewhere within one of my memories of the storage room. This wasn't anything like this morning or with her mother at the funeral home. This time I felt comforted, less alone. She let go of my hand and gave a mock shiver. Yeesh, you're right. That is one depressing place, dude. Seriously. Told you. Can I ask you a question? You mean besides that one? She giggled. Don't be a smarty pants. It makes me want to smack you. And your question? Her face became very serious, very adult looking. Why do you do this? How did you get this job? What do you do for money? I mean, geez, it's not like somebody pays you for this, do they? That's four questions. She huffed. What? You got to be somewhere in like 10 minutes or something? Okay, it's four questions. Big deal. Will you tell me, please? By now, I backed out and was heading to the apartment. I decided to take a few small detours. If I was going to tell her about this, it was going to be in the car, not in the apartment. I had never spoken about this while in the apartment, and I never would. Something about Rebecca's presence made talking about it seem distasteful, as if I would be dishonoring my wife's memory, or the memory of the wife I thought I'd known. Melissa cleared her throat dramatically, of course. Well, promise not to interrupt me with a bunch of questions? She mimed, zipping her mouth closed. I'm serious, Melissa. I've never told anyone about this, and I don't want you making jokes. She raised her hand, unzipped her mouth, and said, I'd never make fun of you. Not about something like this, I promise. I flashed my most dazzling, constipated smile. Okay, if something isn't clear, then you can interrupt me. Deal? I held out my hand. Deal, she replied, and she shook on it. Okay, I'm going to answer your questions in reverse order, if that's all right. Just as long as you answer them. I don't get paid for doing this. I live on my savings, the early retirement benefit package for my job, and Rebecca's insurance money. Melissa held up her hand. Okay, I don't like mean to bring up something sad, but if Rebecca killed herself, the insurance company wouldn't pay. I grinned and wagged a finger at her. Oh, no, 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 no. That's a myth. A lot of insurance companies do everything they can to keep alive. The truth is, there are several companies who will pay on a life insurance policy when a person commits suicide. They wait a year, and they pay only the face value of the policy, but they do pay. Suicide is considered a result of an undiagnosed mental illness. You'd be surprised at how many companies quietly do this. How do you know all that? Do you know what I did for 22 years before Rebecca died and I took early retirement? Melissa shook her head. I sold life insurance. Oh. My. God. That is so funny. That is like the goofiest thing I've heard all week. Is it okay that I think it's goofy? I nodded. I've come to see a certain irony in it. I gave her a look. I know what irony means, she said. My teachers told Mommy I was gifted. I don't doubt that. Yeah, well, what you gonna do? Hey, how old are you anyway? I'll turn 47 next month. Oh, man, your birthday's coming up? Dude, I could so make you the best birthday cake. I stopped celebrating my birthday a long time ago. Oh, no, you don't, Melissa. No arguments. She sighed, pouting. Okay, you were saying... Rebecca didn't have her policy through my company. My ex-company is the one that won't pay out on a suicide. Well, that sucks. From the mouth of babes. Does that answer your question about my financial state? So you got enough money to live on for the rest of your life? If I'm careful. The apartment's paid for. Rebecca and I made some good investments. I'm not rich, Melissa, but I'm okay. Cool beans. She turned toward me a little more and folded her arms across her chest. So how'd you get this job and why you? I don't think of it as a job, Melissa. More like... Like what? My throat tightened a little and I coughed. Could we go back to that one later? Okay. I pulled into the underground parking garage and I had to dig out the card key, then drove over to my assigned parking space near the elevators. I turned off the ignition, removed the keys, and sat looking at them in my hand. What is it? asked Melissa. Come on, Neil. You were going real good there. Can I ask you something? Sure. 
Why wasn't your dad at your funeral? You never even mentioned him. My dad's dead. He died before I was born. He had some big party with some of his friends right after he and mommy found out she was pregnant. He was drunk and got in a wreck. He had a treat. There wasn't anybody else in the car with him though, so that was lucky. She looked down at her hands. I only know him from like pictures and videotapes and what mommy said about him. It's not the same, you know? It sounds like he might have been really cool, kind of like you. You think I'm cool? A shrug. Don't let it go to your head, though. You would have been a pretty cool dad, though, I think. For a moment, we just looked at one another. Then she scooted closer to me and put my arm around her shoulder. Is this okay? This is good. I like this. Me too. No jolts, no visions, no sudden rush of sensations. Just me with my arm around her shoulders and she with her head resting against my chest. It was nice. Three weeks after Rebecca's funeral, I said to her, I came back to the apartment and found her sleeping in the guest room, just like you saw her. That's where I'd um, found her body. She'd taken a bunch of prescription tranquilizers, crushed them up, and mixed them with a bowl of oatmeal so she wouldn't vomit. She'd been gathering the pills for months, and I had no idea. First, I didn't know what to think. I mean, I watched the coffin with her body lowered into the ground, yet here she was, back in the guest room. The rotting part, if that's what it is, rotting, that didn't start for almost three months. But that night, when she first reappeared, I couldn't stop looking at her. She was breathing. I could, I could see her chest rise and fall. I could hear the air going in and out of her lungs, and it was just like she was taking a nap. I just figured that I'd been holding it all in, you know, the grief. I'd been holding it all in, and I'd simply snapped gone a little crazy, so I pulled out a bottle of booze, and I got good and tanked. I decided I was going to wake her up. I stomped over to the bed, reached out, and gave her arm a good shake, and that's when... Ugh, you remember what happened with us this morning, right? Uh-huh. Something like that happened with Rebecca. It wasn't as strong as what happened this morning, but it was bad enough. I had a single flash of what had been in her mind during her last moments, and it, it, it was awful, Melissa. She was so lonely, and I never knew it. She felt like I was a stranger to her, had been for years. Even now, hearing myself say it aloud, I couldn't quite grasp it. I mean, people like to think that when somebody they love dies, that that person is thinking about them, about those they're leaving behind, right at the end. I shook my head. Rebecca wasn't thinking about me at all. I wasn't even a distant thought. I had pretty much ceased to exist for her. Melissa reached over and squeezed my hand. I'm so sorry. But I couldn't stop, not now. But then something fell out of her hand. I lifted up the car keys. A key wrapped in a piece of paper. It was a note in her handwriting. It had an address on it and a number and the words, Look in your other wallet. That's where I found the card key to the storage facility. The other key was for the padlock on the unit door, number 23. That's where you keep the boxes. I nodded. But that night, when I went to the place, there was only one box. He was filled with things of Rebecca's I never knew she had. Children's books, stuffed toy animals, a shadow box of antique sewing thimbles, a watercolor pad filled with these gorgeous paintings she'd done in hell. I never even knew she liked to paint. Fifteen years we'd been married and I had no idea. There were notebooks of poetry she'd written, programs for theatrical production she'd done in high school and college. It was just these precious keepsakes from someone I never knew. But the worst of it were the letters. She'd been having... I can't call it an affair because the two of them never... Um, they didn't have sex. It's okay to say something like that to me. I couldn't look at her. I was too embarrassed. They'd been high school sweethearts and had met each other about 10 years or so after she and I were married. They talked on the phone a lot, met for lunch, but made sure they were never alone together. He was married as well with a bunch of kids, but the letters, my God, Melissa, he loved her so much and she loved him. She told him things she never told me. She had both his letters and hers. He'd sent hers back when he finally broke it off. It had just gotten to, I don't know, too painful for both of them. I sat in that damned room all night reading them. By the time I finished the last one, I knew I'd been the runner-up for her all along. I was the consolation prize for not getting the man she was meant to have been with. I wanted her back right then. I still do. I could have been a better man, the kind of man who deserved to be her husband. If I hadn't been so busy making sure we had all of our ducks in a row, everything paid for, always keeping track of the money, the investments, all that pointless bullshit. 
and maybe I would have noticed how lonely she was. I loved her just as much as he did, but I was never good at showing it, expressing it with words like I should have. You're a very cautious man, Neil. That's what she used to say to me. Cautious. I pulled in a deep breath, squeezed Melissa's shoulder, and pushed out the rest of it. After that night, I kept checking on her, and I kept finding new pieces of paper with names on them and addresses of the hospital or nursing homes or the hospice. It didn't take me very long to figure out what I was supposed to do. The first few were kind of tough. I had to dig through the dumpsters in order to find the boxes. But after I began figuring things out, the boxes, they weren't so hard to find. They'd be on top of all the garbage or sometimes even sitting beside the dumpsters. I even know the schedules now. The hospital disposes of unclaimed personal effects every Tuesday night. The nursing home on 21st Street gets rid of them on Thursday. The retirement center puts their unclaimed boxes out on Friday in the hospice. Sunday night, said Melissa. Sunday night. So you've been doing this for three years, huh? Yeah. Must get lonely. I thought of her on the playground, laughing with friends I couldn't see. It does sometimes. Even when I've got visitors like you and Lenny and all the rest. I even tried to stop doing it once, but that's when Rebecca started to... deteriorate. There, I said it. I keep hoping that if I get to people's effects right away, it'll stop the process and she'll start getting better. But then I remember she's dead. There's no getting better from that. So why do you think you're the one doing this? I looked at her this time. I don't know for sure, but I hope, I hope that if I do enough, then she'll forgive me for not being there for her, for being such a bad person, for being so distant and unthinking and, and cautious. I nodded. Cautious. Maybe it's kind of like what the priests make you do after confession. Say an Our Father, or Hail Mary, or Act of Contrition. Penance. Sounds like that to me. Mommy always used to say, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be. We were both startled by the sound of someone banging on the driver's side window. I actually shrieked, which made Melissa giggle afterward. You ever going to get out of that damn car? Shouted Lenny. I got something to show you. I opened the door, but Lenny was blocking my escape. Got me a new toy today. He held up what could have only have been a digital camera and a fairly expensive one at that. Some smart-ass yuppie type left this at the library. I always wanted these, so I figured what the fuck. Oops, pardon the language, little lady. Melissa grinned. That's okay, I've heard worse. We climbed out of the car. Lenny removed his hat and offered his hand. Your name is Lenny Kessler. Hi, I'm Melissa. She grabbed his hand and gave it a solid shake. Well now, it's a real pleasure to meet you, Melissa. I guess old Neil here has mentioned me. Am I right? Tell me I'm right. You're right. Where's your lady friend from this morning? My la- Oh, you mean Theresa, the woman in the dress. Uh-huh. I saw you two talk, and I watched from the window. She's pretty, pretty full of herself, but yeah, she's a looker. I'm afraid she and I didn't exactly hit it off. He looked at me. Pity. I'd have given a year's pay for her to have unleashed the hounds and give me a look at those bazooba wobblies under that designer dress. Melissa giggled. You're funny. Glad someone here thinks so. Lenny winked at her and faced me. So you were about to ask me why I was at the library in the first place? I sighed. Lenny, it's already been a long day, and it isn't even six yet. I see you're still your usual bucket of chuckles. That's all right. I'll tell you you're on your way up to your place. By the way, I hope you got some of that good hooch left. I'm a bit parched. The three of us headed toward the elevators. I pushed the up button and waited. I was looking through this book at the library, said Lenny, all about brain science and what the writers call the biology of belief, right? They said all our brains contain what they call a God area. A place where the spiritual and the biological come together during moments of euphoria. And that got me thinking about you and all your cells. Remember, you horseshit. So I, and I held up a hand, silencing him. You still have your wallet on you, Lenny? Always. He pulled it from his back pants pocket. Not much money in there, though. Gimme. I took it from his hand, opened it, and thumbed through its contents until I found what I was looking for. I pulled out a card, read it, saw Lenny's signature, and laughed. What? said Lenny. You find a naked picture of me or something? Sorry if you feel inadequate at the sight of it, but you were an organ and tissue donor, Lenny. <laughs> he pulled the card and wallet out from my hands. Yeah, so... Oh, wait a minute. I don't know what they took and what they didn't, but according to that card, you agreed to donate your corneas. The rest of you could have been a goddamn awful mess, Lenny, but corneas are among the first things to take from a donor. He stared at the card and looked at me. So you were right? I mean, the cells in my corneas? 
are still active somewhere in the sockets of some lucky person. Well, hell, don't that beat all? The elevator arrived and its doors open. It was empty. I want to ask a favor of you two, I said, stepping in and holding the door open. Would you two mind just popping on up to the apartment and letting me ride up by myself? It's nothing personal, but I um, just need a minute or two by myself. You're not going to sneak out for something like that, are you? asked Melissa. Where would I go? She nodded. Good point. She grabbed Lenny's hand. Okay, Mr. Gloomy Gus, we'll see you upstairs. The doors closed. I pushed the button to my floor, waited a few seconds until I felt the elevator start moving. Then my legs gave out and I dropped ass first on the floor, burying my face in my hands and crying. God damn it. Three years. Three years it had taken me to get the walls built, to train myself not to feel anything. In the course of two days, Melissa had bulldozed right through them and everything I've been trying to avoid thinking about, confronting, admitting to myself, all of it followed right behind her, blasting into me like the heat from a furnace. There should be a way to scrape the guilt and regret and sadness from the places in you where it builds up like plaque on your connective tissue, making it almost impossible for you to get out of bed and face the day because it hurts too much to even move. There should be a tool that you can carry for those times when little undetected pieces of that plaque breaks loose and begins moving toward your core. A tool that can enter the flesh without spilling blood or scarring tissue and simply scour it away, cut it out, and leave you in safe oblivion where nothing touches you and nothing moves you. Nothing matters. Fuck! I said aloud to no one and nothing. I pulled up my head, saw that I was almost to my floor and got to my feet, wiping my eyes as best I could. And hoping like hell that damned elevator didn't stop at another floor for someone else to get on. I did not want anyone to see me this way. The doors opened on my floor. No one was waiting there. I made a beeline for my door key in hand and slipped quickly inside. In the kitchen, Melissa was gathering together the ingredients for her popcorn while Lenny poured himself a generous drink. I walked by them as fast as I could, claiming I need to use the bathroom, and that's when I heard Melissa sing. A gentle breeze from Hushabai Mountain softly blows or Lullaby Bay. It fills the sails of boats that are waiting, waiting to sail your worries away. And I couldn't move. Hey, Neil, called Lenny. You want a belt of this stuff? That doesn't go with my popcorn, said Melissa. Only soda pop or strawberry smoothies. I pulled in a thick, snot-filled breath, went to my office, grabbed a box of Melissa's personal effects and stomped back into the living room, dropping the box on the sofa. It's time for you to pick something, I said a little more loudly than I would have preferred. Melissa stuck her head out from the kitchen. It's time for me to what? You heard me, I said, pulling the lid off the box. Time to go, Melissa. Get in here and choose something right now. She looked at the box and at me. She was trying not to show up, but I could see that inside of her something had crumpled. But that's not fair. You said I had to wait. My dumb rules, remember? I can change them if a goddamn will want to. Now get your ass in here and pick something. But, but, but nothing. I don't need this. I don't want this. Everything is fine until you show it up with your questions and your dude and freakazoid and touchy-feely and you've been a pretty cool dad and the rest of it. I, look at me. I'm not your dad, Melissa. He's dead. Just like you. Just like Lenny. Just like Rebecca. Let's like I'll be someday and the sooner the fucking better. Even I was startled at how loudly I was screaming at her. Lenny stood behind her, hand on her shoulder. Hey, Neil, buddy, what's this shit? This shit ain't none of your business, Lenny. I threw down the lid and I started toward Melissa, who backed up against Lenny, her eyes widening with fear. I stopped again. Jesus Christ, what was I doing? She was actually scared of me. She'd been having such a good time at the playground, too, but of course I knew what I was doing. I was just being cautious. Remove the source of what makes me feel anything, and I would cease to feel once again, and all could continue as before. I covered my mouth with my hand. Oh, God. Have you been crying? said Melissa. I think you need a belt of the good stuff, said Lenny. I looked back at the box with the lid on the floor and realized what a horrible, terrible, vicious thing I had just done. Once... The lid had been removed in their presence. They have to choose. I don't know why it's that way. It just is. Oh, God, Melissa, I said, pulling my hand away from my mouth. I am so sorry. I I was upset um, because, because it's okay, she said, her tone neutral, her expression unreadable. She set down the bowl she was going to use for popcorn, squeezed Lenny's hand, walked right up to the box, examining its scant contents. 
All right, she said in the slightest quaver in her voice. I made my decision. Can you forgive me? We'll have to see about that. She turned away, picked up the lid, and placed it on the box. There's nothing in there I want. Sorry, Freakzoid. Looks like you're stuck with me. What are you doing? Making my choice. She walked over to me, gave me that, I'm going to touch you now look, and held my hand. I choose to stay here with you. And I know you're not my dad, but I never knew him. She pulled on my arm, forcing me to bend down slightly. But I know you, and I really want to stay. And then she kissed my cheek. You need somebody to take care of you, because it sure looks like you can't do it yourself. I mean, dude, have you looked at that bathroom of yours? I mean, really looked at it? I've seen science experiments that were less gross. We stood in silence for a few moments, and then all three of us turned in the direction of the guest room. Was that you, Lenny? I asked. Yay, I've been working on my ventriloquist act, learning to throw the sound of my coffin. What the hell do you think, Sal boy? I looked at Melissa. She's never coughed before. You sure? Yeah. Well, then, maybe we ought to go um, check on her? The three of us moved toward the guest room. I opened the door and saw that the light of early evening, golden yet somehow gray at the same time, was filtering through the blind on the window, casting soft, glowing lines across Rebecca's body. Melissa moved away from me and opened the blinds a little more, not all the way, just enough that Rebecca looked for a moment like a figure in a painting, the black patches on her skin looking more deliberate shadows added toward the end by the artist's brush or charcoal pencil. There's less of them, I whispered. Yeah, said Melissa, walking over to the bed and sitting by Rebecca's side. She still doesn't look too good, but she looks better, don't you think? I started to say something, but then Rebecca coughed again, a soft, dry sound, and moved her head ever so slightly to the right, as if getting more comfortable. I heard the bones in her neck softly crack as she did this, and then she released a small sound, a low, gentle, but satisfied sigh. There, that's better. Melissa took hold of Rebecca's hand. Huh. That's weird. What? It was all I could do to say that much. Melissa looked at me. She's thinking about cheeseburgers. Oh, man, said Lenny from behind me. Neil, you have to let me take a picture of her, all three of you. Now, waiting for a response, he powered up the camera and nodded for me to go over to the bed. I moved as if drunk or drugged and sat on the other side of my wife. Take her hand, said Melissa. I hesitated. I'll make sure nothing happens, she said. I promise. I took Rebecca's hand in both of mine. I felt almost no different from the other times I dared to touch her hand. Clammy, moist, lifeless. But I could sense, far beneath the facade of her tissue, the facade that was ultimately all flesh, the tiniest wave of warmth struggling to swim to the surface. It's going to be a long time still, said Melissa, but at least she'll have company. So will you. She leaned forward. Please don't ever yell at me like that again. You scared me. I know. You hurt my feelings. Never again, hon. Never again. Lenny aimed the camera, got us in focus. No, there are some cultures that believe if you take a person's picture, you steal part of their soul. Then take a lot of pictures, said Melissa. You can keep all of our souls together in there. She smiled at me. That way we can be kind of a family. Kinda. Does that make sense? works for me, I said, my voice suddenly hoarse. I'm going to make chocolate cake for your birthday, Melissa said. Chocolate's good for birthdays. I thought of the rest of my life, knowing that there was now more of it behind me than ahead, and of the days I would spend in these rooms watching over Rebecca with Melissa nearby to take care of me, and wondered if maybe I'd find that it had some meaning after all. Maybe Rebecca would come all the way back to me, and maybe she wouldn't. But if there was even a chance I could win her heart as I should have, that I could love and treasure her the way I always should have, then I would not push it away. I would continue to collect the boxes of personal effects and help those who came to my door to find their way to wherever they went once their choice had been made. I would grow old with my wife and this little girl for company, and the day would come when I would find myself in a hospital, nursing home, or hospice bed, and I knew they'd be there as well, watching over me, whispering memories into my ears, singing lost lullabies as I released the final relieved breaths, feeling the weight, purpose, 
and meaning forever lifted from my eyes and afterward afterward there will be a hallway its polished floor shining under the glow of overhead fluorescent lights and into this hallway there will be wheeled a gurney with a sheet covered body and the wheels will squeak softly as it's rolled toward the far end where only one elevator waits and this elevator only goes in one direction as the gurney is wheeled away another person dressed in hospital or hospice whites will shuffle from the room carrying a box with my name written on its side and they will carry this box to the front desk knowing that come Tuesday or Thursday or Sunday it will be discarded with the other unclaimed possessions left to time the elements or other mysteries best not dwelt upon for too long. It is, after all, only a book of stuff, of left-behind things, items with no meaning to anyone except the person who can no longer touch them, hold them, or tell the stories of how this book meant something, this ring was precious, this cross picture was beautiful because... But for now, right now, this moment, I hold my wife's hand and Melissa holds her other hand, and in this way we are one, and it needs to be captured to be noted in order to make it true, not only in the moment, but in memory as well. I look at Melissa and smile, and I hope that all I want her to know can be seen in that smile, and I hope, God, how I hope, how strange a feeling it is to hope, that we'll know in a few seconds after Lenny takes the picture. I look at him think, take it. Take it as we are now. We're looking at you as we are now. Take it. Take it. Take it. Thank you, my lovelies, for sticking with Miss Murder through that um, rather intense story. Um, if you used as many tissues as I did trying to read through it, um, I wouldn't be surprised. Even in horror, the human element does come in and this had plenty of it and I don't have anything else to say other than that so until next time my lovelies good night <laughs>